Good evening, everyone. I'm Kat Mueller, Educator of Adult Programs here at the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art. And it's my and my colleagues' pleasure to welcome you as we celebrate the museum's featured photography exhibition, Gordon Parks Times Muhammad Ali, The Image of a Champion, 1966 to 1970. Also, thank you so much for joining us today with all the turmoil happening in Kansas <laughs> City at the moment. We do appreciate you coming out and supporting us and our speakers. A quick note about our Q&A session um, at the end of the program. On your way in, you were able to pick up a note card and pencil. Please write any questions you may have throughout the program on the note card and raise your hand. And myself uh, and my colleagues, uh, Krishan and Natalie, could you just do a quick little wave? Um, one of us will come by and grab them for you uh, and we'll collect them for the speakers. If you do still need a note card and pencil, we do have more in the back and Krishan can um, bring them to you if you need an extra one or anything. Moving on, tonight we're delighted to present another wonderful program centered on this exhibition. Please also join us for future programs, including the continuation of tonight's topic on Thursday, June 25th at the Bruce R. Watkins Cultural Center for a screening of and conversation around the short film Concerned Student 1950, depicting the power of student athletic protests at the University of Missouri. Tickets are available on Eventbrite now, and for more details on all the listed programs, please check out the website or stop by the info desk. I'd also like to take a quick moment to acknowledge a special guest joining us tonight, Kirk Sharp from mm -hmm. the Gordon Parks Museum uh, from Fort Scott, Kansas. <laughs> Tonight's program will contextualize the photographs in our exhibition, culled from the two Life magazine photo essays about Muhammad Ali by Gordon Parks in 1966 and 1970, within the social and political environment of the period. Additionally, we'll explore how Ali's legacy fits within the history of sports and American history more generally as well, and the history of celebrated black athletes in the post-World War II period and beyond. Here to examine these issues, we're honored to welcome William C. Roden and Damian Thomas. William C. Roden, the former award-winning sports columnist for the New York Times and author of $40 Million Slaves, The Rise, Fall, and Redemption of the Black Athlete, is a writer at large for The Undefeated, the online platform for exploring the intersections of race, sports, and culture. Damian Thomas is the curator of sports at the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. He earned a PhD in United States History at UCLA. Prior to joining the museum, he was an assistant professor at the University of Maryland College Park and the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, where he taught courses that focused on sports in United States history, sports and U.S. race relations, and sports and black masculinity. He is the author of Globe Trotting, African American Athletes, and Cold War Politics. And here to moderate the conversation is curator of photography, April Watson, who organized the exhibition that you'll hear about tonight in collaboration with the Gordon Parks Foundation. So now please help me welcome William C. Roden, Damian Thomas, and April Watson. Thank you. Um, I th are we, can you guys hear me okay with the, the mics? Okay. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, thank you both for coming. It's such an honor to have the experts here tonight. Um, and as Kat said, you know, the, the goal of tonight's program is to really kind of contextualize these two Life Magazine assignments that Gordon Parks did um, for, uh, uh, that focused on Muhammad Ali. Uh, we'll get this going. Let me try to turn off and on again. Um, there we go. Uh, and there you see the 1966 assignment on the left, the 1970 on the right. Um, and in, in addition to kind of thinking about um, Ali and other black athletes in this time period, which of course is the ongoing civil rights movement, the rise of black nationalism, the Vietnam War, um, all of which impacted uh, black athletes in this arena of professional sports. Um, we're also going to kind of weave through this theme um, th that focus our discussion on the role that the media plays in shaping public perceptions of athletes, which is a key theme of the exhibition because uh, in many ways, um, Gordon Parks was working for Life magazine. He really was the media. Um, uh, he well understood um, that he held an influential position at Life magazine. He had worked there as the only full-time black staff photographer throughout the 50s. Um, by the 1960s, he 
is working on contract for the magazine along with other photographers. This is sort of the, the, the beginning of the financial downturn of, of, of Life magazine. Um, but he's working on contract basis. Uh, he had a tremendous amount of respect from editors and from readers. So he knew that he could use Life's broad platform to reach its target demographic, which were white middle class audiences and use uh, photography and his, his own writing. In 1966, he wrote the accompanying essay to shape a nuanced, intimate, and very human portrait of Ali at a very controversial moment in his early career. Um, so he definitely played a role in, in shaping uh, and showing Ali in a, in a sympathetic light. And just to kind of show you sort of an overview, if you haven't been down to the exhibition, um, some of the themes that come across uh, in the um, in the photographs um, is that you see that Parks is really showing various facets of Ali devoid of the kind of bravado that he often showed to photographers. Uh, he shows Ali as an athlete, uh, Ali as a role model uh, with children, with uh, other members of the community in Miami. Um, also pictures, I think, that show Ali in a more sort of vulnerable, physically vulnerable, um, but also, you know, very, again, very intimate. You can imagine Ali wouldn't let just anybody take these pictures of him. Um, also focusing on, especially that picture on the left of his bruised and blistered fist, focusing on the, on the brutality of the, of the sport, um, which is already taking its toll on Ali, who was about 24 years old at, at the time of this assignment. Um, also, you know, photographing um, that facet of Ali that was controversial at the time, his affiliation with the Nation of Islam, um, which Parks wrote about in the 66 essay, but, uh, and, and uh, photographed, those photographs didn't make it into the magazine, not surprisingly. Um, but he's photographing sort of Ali in these quiet moments of prayer, also showing uh, Ali sort of after he attended a, a meeting uh, at, at Ali's Miami mosque. So he took pictures there and um, kind of wrote about the emotional impact of, of the sort of the, the, the meeting at the mosque. But he, uh, and he took pictures, but again, they didn't get published. So he's trying to sort of, as a reporter, show all facets of, of this aspect of, of Ali. And then another sort of theme that comes up in the show is this influence of the media. Um, he parks in many of the pictures seems just as fascinated with the media's reaction to Ali as he is with Ali himself. Um, and of course, I love the picture on the right because it shows Ali reading about himself, uh, which is uh, which is a great insight on the part of, of Gordon Parks. So that's sort of the, the collective portrait of Ali that Parks is, is showing to readers. When it was published in 66, it, it hit its mark with audiences. A lot of letters from the editor said, uh, you know, I was unsure of Ali before this story, but now I really understand his motivations and beliefs. So it really worked effectively for, for the magazine. Um, but we're going to dive a little bit deeper now into this whole idea of why um, in 1966, Parks and his editors at Life Magazine felt there was a need to, quote, redeem the champion. Um, and I'll read a little passage from the essay, which sort of articulates the various, quote, sins against Ali um, as portrayed in the, in the press. So this is Gordon Parks writing for, for his audience. So he said, Ali's public image was in tatters. He stood accused in the press of sins ranging from talking too much to outright anti-white bigotry. There had been rumblings of dislike for him since he became a Muslim. Then late last winter when he declared, quote, I don't have no quarrel with those Viet Congs, he became in the public eye, not just a loudmouth kid, but a, quote, shameless traitor. I began to feel a certain sympathy for him. There was a side to this brash poetry spouting kid that I admired. I was not proud of him as I had been of Joe Lewis. Muhammad was a gifted black champion and I wanted him to be a hero. I felt that he could not possibly be quite so bad as he was made out to be uh, in the press. So let's begin, Bill or Damien, sort of talking about, you know, maybe sort of starting with his first sin, quote unquote, of the perception of him being outspoken, you know, his reputation as the Louisville lip. And, and why, why did this upset so many people? Mm -hmm. I'll be sure. <laughs> so I, I think what, what's interesting about Muhammad Ali is that in many ways he was bringing aspects of African-American culture to the forefront. 
Certainly, if you think about the idea of playing the dozens or joining, um, those aspects of African-American culture where you are using verbal wit and verbal skill to attack people, but in a playful manner, I think was something that, that America had a hard time kind of understanding. And so in some ways, it was this, this sort of clash of cultures that was taking place. There's a famous, uh, famous scholar who said that the difference between black and white people is that black people, we know when we're playing. And I think <laughs> Ali was caught up in, in this, this cultural translation, which was quite difficult for a lot of people to understand. Yeah, yeah it's, it's um, so fine. And, and, and by the way, I just want to echo what you had said, April, too, about everybody who came out here. Yeah. <laughs> I really appreciate you because uh, you did interesting times. Um, but, you know, uh, the great thing about uh, this assignment that you gave us, uh, <laughs> I, you know, I, I, Ali was um, my generation. I yeah. mean, he was my guy. But I'd forgotten how great Gordon Parks was. Mm -hmm. You know, we tend to take him for granted. And uh, I forgot just how immensely talented that he was. Yeah. And the whole idea of all these firsts. And I think that that, in, that informed a lot of his attitude toward Ali. I mean, uh, Parks was like, would have been my dad's age. Yeah. And my father and I had these debates about Ali. Right. You know, and how, you know, my dad was a big Joe Lewis guy. Right. You know, I remember I sent him a, I sent him a first galley of, of my book. And he called me up. It was, he said, where's Joe Lewis? <laughs> you know, you know. But but through through Ali, I understood exactly how strongly he felt and Gordon Parks felt about um, uh, Lewis because I, and, and Ali was everything for my gender, everything that uh, uh, that Joe Lewis kind of was not at least on the surface. Right. He was right. brash. Um, remember his the other quote about Vietnam was that he said. Uh, I'm not going to use the N-word, but he said, no Viet Cong has ever called me an N. Yeah, yeah. You know, and that really resonated. He said, you know, so, um, uh, and, and, and that profile, I thought that profile was, was very, because remember, this was a big, prestigious thing. Absolutely, and, and yeah. Ali, and interesting about that, Ali was aware of how prestigious it was. You know, he yeah. said, why are you coming out, you know, why are you coming out here to do this on me? So, um that was really, really important. Like you said, the idea that he had to be redeemed. Right. I think, I know we'll talk about that, but the whole premise was preposterous. Right. <laughs> you know, that he had to be redeemed. In the eyes of and, Life magazine readers, maybe, right? Yeah. Right, right, yeah. right. Sort of kind of white, mainstream right. people who thought he had to be redeemed. And there, there are people who probably today mm -hmm. would still think mm -hmm. that he had to be redeemed. I, I, one of the things that I... Uh, I found uh, in talking to people as early as or late as like three or four years ago, how many people still did not like Ali? Hmm. You know, I mean, in, in, in death and later life, you know, people, the thing changes. Like he was like an angel. But there are people who hated him then and who hated him now, everything hmm. he stood for hmm. against the war and all, which is, of course, why we loved him. Right, right. Um, well, let's talk a little bit. These are just a couple pictures of, of the very young Muhammad Ali, age 12. And then when he won, of course, the 1960 Olympics um, over there on the right. Uh, this, you know, these, this is sort of, I, I threw this in. This is by Philip, Philip Paulsman, kind of, you know, emphasizing him mugging for the camera, really his mouth open, really emphasizing the fact that he could never shut his mouth sort of a thing in 63. Also, just to sort of, again, point out the contrast between the pictures that Gordon Parks took versus this kind of thing, which is more of a, uh, you know, kind of a, a sort of editorial assignment. Um, but I also wanted to kind of talk about Ali in this history of black boxers and particularly starting going back to Jack Johnson and who Ali kind of looked, looked back to, right, as a, with some admiration. Um, and then to think about Joe Lewis again after, after we talk about this. Yeah, I mean, um, I remember uh, there was a great documentary series. I don't, I wish I could find it. I erased it. Uh, but it was called Ali Ra Rates the Champs. And it was a two-day It was a two -day thing. And he and Al Cosell mm -hmm. started off at the very beginning. And they did two days worth of analyzing 
Mm-hmm. Boxing. It was the most unbelievable. Thing I find, and I taped over it, of course. And, <laughs> <laughs> but one of the things he said when he got to when, when he got to Jack Johnson, he looked at it, and he said two things. He said, you know, uh, he, he looked at him and said, you know, I, th- how did he do this? He said, mm-hmm. you know, uh, how did he do this? He said, I'm just joking, but what he had to go through. And then he ended up saying, and I wonder who was behind him. You know, right? You know, but he really admired, uh, as I think a lot of his brashness, uh, the fact that he set his own rules, and, and particularly like in, in when he did it, 1919, 1920. And it's so very interesting, just like the Joe Lewis camp, distance, they, they, they didn't want Joe Lewis to be like Jack Johnson. Mm-hmm. Later, you know, Ali sort of was, you know, I think Joe Lewis always kind of admired Ali, but there was still a little bit of that generational difference. Yeah, come on, yeah. boy, you know, right. You know, you know, we're trying to that kind of thing. Yeah. But it's so th- th- that Johnson, Lewis, Ali, I just found yeah. very fascinating. And what made Johnson so I mean so controversial, you know, well, in look, the look at the picture to your right. right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, here's a guy who when he fought the Great White Hope in Reno. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we're talking about like 19... 1908, 10, 1910, yeah, 10, yeah. You know, and they were like, like you know, one, the only person cheering for Jack Johnson was her. <laughs> <laughs> His white wife. <laughs> you know, and he told, I mean, he told, he told the black people and white people to kiss my ass. Right, right. You know, it's right. like that I'm, he's, I'm nobody's slave. You mm-hmm. know, he was, and I think that I, if you were Ali, he had to be your role model. Sure, sure. Um, and then Joe Lewis, uh, which you had already kind of mentioned here, mm-hmm. um, in a beautiful portrait by Carl Van Bechten. We actually have that portrait in our collection. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, the big fight um, uh, against Max Schmeling. But, but, you know, let, me, let me just say yep. um, one thing about Lewis, because, you know, it, the, the stereotype is, you know, Joe was you know, not, quote, unquote, articulate and the white man's... You know, but I remember my uh, father-in-law, who was a lieutenant in the army, told me a story about Lewis, and they were in an officers' club playing cards, an all-black officers' club playing cards. And so the white officers came because they wanted to show Joe Lewis off at the dance, and uh, they came over and said, "Joe, come on, you know, let, let, let's go." And so Joe looked at the guys and said, "Okay, let's go." He talked to all of them. He said, "He said, no, no, j- just you, Joe." And then Joe sat back down, picked up his card, said, "Deal." <laughs> and that told me so much about right. about that he was really a black man, mm-hmm. a proud black man. Not like Ali, because he couldn't afford to be, but mm-hmm. he was a proud black man. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think if you, you think about the, the relationship between Jack Johnson, who violated all of these social customs, marrying white women, but not just white women, but he would marry working white women women who had an illicit past and and <laughs> engaged in the world's oldest profession <laughs> and so it was it was the way in which he he sort of picked his wives was mm-hmm. also quite controversial so when jack johnson lost the title in in 1915 it took 22 mm-hmm. years before another african american was allowed to fight for the championship And so, so much of Joe Lewis's career was about proving that he was not going to be Jack Johnson once he won the title. Mm -hmm. And so he had seven rules, uh, no throwing fights. You can't even take a picture with the white woman. Um, (laughs) Really rules that that were used to kind of craft an image of him that, that, that suggested that he would be a good a good steward of being the heavyweight champion, which was still the most prestigious um, sports title. He also had to agree to give James Braddock, who he fought for the title in 1937, 10% Mm. of his income for the next 10 years. And it was only after agreeing to do that and following these social customs that Lewis got a a chance to fight for the title. Wow. Mm. Uh, you know, wow, 10%. For the, that's, <laughs> you know, but, you know, the, uh, the thing, too, when we're talking about Lewis, because, you know, I mean, he did privately, 
he did, you know, have relations with white women. He 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 would uh, uh, develop a, a, a drug problem, and so you had to figure how much of not really able to be. I mean, Jack Johnson was free, in a, in a way that Joe Lewis was not free, and then in a way that Muhammad Ali became free. You know, so Joe Joe was kind of caught in this vice because he really could not be free. And and what we loved about Jack Johnson is that he could be free. And I think that's what Ali loved about mm -hmm. Jack Johnson is that, you know, I'm a free black man. And that, I know for us, it has really resonated, mm -hmm. you know, for, for a lot of us to be free. And it's sort of interesting. You think of, you talk about your dad and, and what Lewis meant for this generation, where the, the ultimate kind of respect that you could play, place or give an African-American that's time was to call them a race man. Yeah. This was someone who's committed to the racial upliftment of his people. And what that meant often was that you had to be a person of respectability, the way you carried yourselves, the way, the way that, 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 that you presented who you were. And so Lewis is a product of this era where, where many men kind of modeled themselves under, under Lewis's um, image, where he was uh, said to be a credit to his race mm -hmm. because of the way he handled himself in that performance of black masculinity. And so it was based on this idea that through good behavior, you could change white mm -hmm. perceptions of black people. And it's a different understanding of race and racism and race relations, where people thought that racism was much more about individual acts and attitudes. And so how do you present yourself in a way to change those ideas? Where once you get to Ali, particularly in the mid 1960s, when African-Americans largely taught to talk about race, they're talking about structural issues. Mm -hmm. And so it's a different generation and, uh, and both men become reflective of, of those larger ideas of black masculinity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And probably had he come along now, I mean, I know this will turn into the Joe Lewis show, but I, but I, <laughs> but I think that, I, I do think it's true. Probably if you did not have Joe Lewis, you might not have mm -hmm. Ali. Mm -hmm. uh, because this guy, you know, Joe was just so, um, so honest. I mean, all you have to do is just look at his left hook. <laughs> there was not a lot of, it was just like a very direct, you know, he said, what do you do? I knock it out. That's what I do. That's my job, <laughs> you know. And it was very direct. And I could see why people my dad's generation just loved him. Remember Eddie Robinson said that he was like the most important, one of the most important men in my life because it was the first time. What did you say? It was the first time. He was the first time in the smelling, smelling fight. Smelling was German. And Joe Lewis Joe Lewis, um, the African American, and so this was as Hitler was was um, trying to sort of take over the world, and so this fight became the proxy: American democracy versus Nazism. And and in in uh, Bill's great documentary, which came out in the mid '90s, "The Journey of the Black Athlete," he interviewed Eddie Robinson, who was the legendary coach of Grambling. University's football team, and he said, listening to that fight was the first time I'd ever heard a black person referred to as an American. Mm. And he talked about how Lewis's stature um, had ramifications for all African Americans. Mm -hmm. right. so, so you could understand moving to Ali, you could understand a guy like Parks. Mm -hmm. You know, and that generation of black men, you know, we all have mentors who would make us pledge, mm -hmm. you know, and talk about all the stuff, it, like, you know, in my view, it was like Sam Lacey, you know, and, you know, uh, I would go on to write for the Baltimore Sun and stuff like that, but I started with Sam at the Afro, and he didn't have all this stuff. I mean, he once said, he, I had to make my career out of concrete, mm -hmm. and so I think if you got a guy like uh, Gordon Parks, who I think we met, Ollie, he was like maybe 50. 50, early 50s, 50, yeah. 50, and Ollie's 25. He said, listen, man, you, you know, you got, you have to pay some dues, some cultural dues here. <laughs> all this stuff is nice, the talking and all that, but are you with the program? Are you going right. to help move the race forward? And, and, I, and, and I did respect that about Gordon because he did play that role that 
that black men and women have played in my life. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, you got to, there's a certain torch mm -hmm. that you got to carry. There's a certain baton. And I'm like, you know, they said, well, you're going to pass the baton. And I remember, said, no, I'm not passing the baton. You got to take the baton. You know, so I think that was Parks' relationship with, 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 with Ali, Ali. Yeah. That you got to take this and you got you to prove yourself. Yeah. I, I think that's, that's, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Um, so kind of moving forward, of course, 64, he, a uh, huge upset, uh, defeats uh, Sonny Liston. Um, I, I talked a little bit to Robert Lipsight when I was writing it, and he had said that, you know, he was just a young New York Times reporter. They sent him down there because they thought, you know, Clay would lose. He said, make sure you know the route to the hospital because that's where you're going to be following him. And of course, huge upset and Lipsight became sort of followed me his career, I think, following Ali. Yeah. Um, and it's, isn't this the quote, I shook up the world and, and uh, of course him. And of course, soon after this, although Ali had been rumored to be affiliated with the Nation of Islam, he officially first changes his name from Cassius Clay to Cassius X and then soon thereafter to Muhammad Ali. So I guess this, of course, is the next uh, sort of quote unquote sin uh, that needed redeeming, and that is his affiliation with uh, the Nation of Islam and his friendship with, with Malcolm X. Um, the picture on the left, I think, is right after he won the, the Liston fight, he went out for ice cream, and then another one from 64 when they're in, in New York City. Um, so, I mean, how. I mean, this was this the most controversial aspect of his career in at this time. Uh, I mean, that in the Vietnam War, of course, but this was really, I think, a, a big thing. I think this this was incredibly huge. One is that in order to understand this moment in '64, you got to go back to the 1960 Olympics mm -hmm. in Rome, where Ali became famous because a Russian reporter came up to him mm. and said. What is it like to win glory for, for a, um, a country in which you can't even buy, our, buy a hamburger in your hometown? And Ali's response made him a national hero because he said, we've got qualified people working on that. We're gonna solve this problem. Um, and at least I'm not living in a hut somewhere. So mm -hmm. it was this sort of denunciation of Africa, celebration of of U.S. democracy and a denunciation of, of uh, Ru the Russian uh, communist system. And so he returned a national hero. And so people thought that he was going to be like Joe Lewis. He was going to be a credit to his words. He was going to be quiet about race relations. And so for him to then the next day after winning the title, come out and say, I'm a member of the Nation of Islam, and I'm not going to be like Floyd Patterson. I'm not going to try to integrate into a white neighborhood that I am rejecting Christianity um, in being a member of the Nation of Islam was an incredibly huge and powerful moment. What people often forget about that moment is that black people also turned their mm -hmm. back on my mm -hmm. Ali. Because mm -hmm. when you denounce Jesus <laughs> in black America in the mid 1960s, right. you are problematic. And so it, it's all of America mm -hmm. now saying, wait a minute. And black people also saying, maybe he's not a symbol of what it is that we're trying to, trying to do and where we're trying to go. And so it was, it was a moment where the entire nation was, was caught off guard. Yeah, mm -hmm. that, that was such a great point about the, the uh, internal battle in our mm -hmm. community, the black community, you know, up until then. And, and I remember me becoming first aware of that because at first it was always, you know, uh, you know, the great white hope or the, you know, Patterson versus Ingmar Johansson, that kind of thing. But now you've got Ali who talks about black, and a lot of black folk, older black folks were freaked out because they were afraid of the black Muslims. Mm -hmm. um, a, maybe because because they were going to bring you into conflict with the, the blue-eyed devil. I mean, was, you know, talk about that in like 19, you know, 64, <laughs> you know. And I remember, remember so fast forward when he's going to fight Liston. Liston was like kind of to a lot of black folks, a hero. <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, A, because he was a line like from Joe Lewis, just stylistically, but also that, well, you know, we choose between a gangster mm -hmm. and black Muslims. 
we'll take the gangster. <laughs> you know, right. uh, and, and I, I think um, who weighed in? Or maybe uh, it was Kennedy. Kennedy weighed in not on that fight. Kennedy weighed in on the Patterson fight Patterson, yeah. mm. that he wanted. You know, he wanted Patterson to kind of you know rough him up. Yeah, and invited know. Patterson to the White House yeah. before his fight with Ali. Yeah, mistake yeah. on Floyd's part. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, and, I mean, and, and I think a lot of us too might you know learn how to talk trash. Mm -hmm. From Ali, uh -huh. because he was a he was masterful, <laughs> masterful yeah. talking trash. I remember, not that I got to fight, but you know you would fight or something, and his big thing was standing over you, and I think this would come later. But you know, what's my name? Right. And that was a whole thing, you know, to stand over somebody, and you know, like what's my name, or or look up at somebody, <laughs> and tell them what's your name, you know. Uh, but uh, just just one, I remember uh, the night that they fought that they, uh, Ali and Liston fought. My father, uh, we were living out in like Phoenix, Illinois, and it was cold, like it was like February, right? And it was on radio. And so I remember my father, you know, just for the fight, he put on, a, he put on his heavy coat and he started heading outside. And I said, where are you going? He said, I'm going back in the yard. I said, for what? He said, to catch clay. Because <laughs> the idea was that clay was gonna knock him <laughs> from Lewis and all the way to Harvard. Yeah. It, it took me a minute too. That's my father. That kind of went. <laughs> you know, um, That's funny. So anyway, moving on. <laughs> right. Um, just to sort of also, I just wanted to mention briefly to put it in context that Parks himself had done a, a feature on the Black Muslims in 63. Um, and uh, this was that Life magazine had tried. Um, not surprisingly, with that, with no success, to use white reporters, um, and then Parks was given the assignment. And when it was published, it got a huge response from Life readers. Some felt that that he had handled it handled it quite objectively, um, but others were completely outraged. I mean, it was a, a, a just a deluge of, of fan mail. And here's just a quote from one. This is Lambert Albegini Jr. of Philadelphia, who wrote mm. to the editors, for several years, I have been disgusted with the manner in which you present everything regarding racial issues. Your May 31st issue was an example. Such trash might be passable for Ebony, but hardly for a fair-minded magazine with at least a majority of white readers. I, for one, do not intend to renew either my present subscription or my Christmas gift subscriptions if I read one more article like that in life. So, and then there was other letters that were threatening Parks uh, um, directly. So this was, it, Parks had had this whole experience going into the whole Ali feature, which I think definitely informed the way he was, he was thinking about things. And, and uh, Malcolm X also, um, he did a, he met Malcolm X through that story, um, did another sort of follow-up right after Malcolm X was assassinated. But they were, uh, they, they kept in touch. And this is a postcard, actually, that uh, Malcolm X sent to, to Parks. Actually, I think when he was visiting, when Malcolm X was visiting Ali. Um, so Malcolm X is a kind of a, a connection between all of them as well. All right, yes. Can I say something about oh, that? Oh, absolutely, yeah. The, if you go back, back to the Life magazine, um, this is an important moment because so much... Of, of America's introduction to the Nation of Islam was a 1959 documentary called The Hate That Hate mm -hmm. Produced, mm -hmm. done by Mike Wallace. And, and in the film, what, what you see is a play that's taking place where they're putting the white man on trial for all of the sins of white civilization. And it was so so powerful in its depiction of this and its denunciation of white America that, that people felt as if, as if this feature in 1963 was, was too celebratory or too, too soft of a, of a profile on, on the Nation of Islam because their understanding had been framed by mm -hmm. the uh, documentary The Hate That Hate Pro Produced. And yeah. wasn't, wasn't that the burden that, that a guy like Parks had to carry, you know, of being the first? You, yeah. you carry the whole weight of, you know, portraying, being, being fair and portraying as, as human. And, you know, uh, it was, it's just a, a tremendous burden. And again, in reading, uh, preparing for this and going back, right. Right. you really have an appreciation of, uh, and anybody who's been the first, Right. First woman, the first, right. first anything. You realize you've got this 
burden of representing the entire gender, the entire race. Right. And I think, and given that, I mean, Gordon Parks did a, I mean, did a great job. Yeah. It, it would, yeah. On balance. Uh, yeah, I mean, and he talked in his later memoirs about how he felt he's walking a tightrope, yeah. particularly in the 60s at life, because he sympathized with his subjects, but also he had to be a reporter, and uh, most of the staff was white. So he, and I think that's one reason he really insisted on writing the essays to go along with a lot of his photographs, because um, he wanted control over the story as much as possible. Um, Right. All right. Well, let's talk about, about this moment. So uh, Ali is stripped of his title, I think, in April of 67 when he refused to, well, he, refused, he was um, uh, convicted on draft evasion and then stripped of his title. And then in 1967, a, a group of athletes sort of organized by Jim Brown uh, convened. So tell us a little bit about, about this moment at the Cleveland Summit. Um, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, you know, uh, by this time, Ali probably was one of the most controversial and polarizing black athletes, uh, athletes in the United States. And uh, Jim Brown, who had just retired from the Cleveland Brown, probably one of the most popular black athletes, uh, convened a, um, he wanted to get all of the top black athletes in here. You've got, you know, Bill Russell, uh, uh, mm -hmm. Abdul Jabbar, who's yeah. Lou Alcindor, yeah. Willie Davis in the back, Bobby Mitchell. I mean, you had Carl Stokes, who's the mayor. Mm -hmm. And uh, they convened because they wanted to, they wanted to um, have a conversation with Ali, see if he really, if he really was a man of conviction. Mm -hmm. And also, they had some business <laughs> stuff too. They had some pay per view. I mean, it wasn't pay per view then, but they just wanted to find out if he really believed in his conviction. And, and a lot of these guys were there were also army people. Mm. You know, Brown was in the army. Uh, most of the guys in the picture were in the army. Mm. Um, mm. And they, they, were, they, they, they met in the back for about, I guess, what, two hours? I wasn't there, mm -hmm. right? Two hours. And when they emerged, they were convinced that Ali was a-, a, a Was legit. He was, he was legit. He was yeah. a conscientious objector. And he met what they said, so they had this very, very important uh, press conference where they told everybody that this group of black athletes is behind Muhammad Ali, mm -hmm. which is which was monumental back then. Yeah. Imagine that today. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think this is an incredibly important moment and important picture. Certainly they have Bill Russell, the outspoken uh, basketball player who wrote his book, first book in 1965, in which was transformative to the world of sports autobiography because until then, until, up to that point, most athletes, when they wrote books, it, would, it was right. in the vein of, here's what sports have done for right. me. But he wrote a book that was critical of race relations. And so that was path breaking. You also have uh, Lou Alcindor, who was still in college. He was a college student at UCLA when he was invited to be a part of this. And he would be part of the 1968 Olympic team that did not go and actually boycotted the Olympics in, in 1968. This is also a key moment because one thing that's, that's important to remember about the Vietnam War is it's the first war that African Americans oppose. Prior to the Vietnam War, African Americans always tried to use their war service as a way to demonstrate their patriotism. A couple of reasons why African Americans turn against this war. One is that African Americans were about 10% of the population, but they were about 32% of those in the military at the time and 50% of those on the front line. Mm -hmm. And that racial inequity was something that became really pronounced for African Americans. The second thing that happened is that by mid-66, President Johnson uh, takes all of the people in his administration that are working on civil rights and he refocuses them on the Vietnam War. And that's a clear signal for black America that Vietnam is now more important than civil rights. And so whereas Ali taking this stand in the black community also much earlier than, than the rest of America turning against this war and then him getting the support of these other prominent athletes was incredibly uh, mm -hmm. important and symbolic. Yeah. 
and, and just the number of young white students who suddenly uh, uh, attached themselves to mm -hmm. Ali. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I think a lot of young people now have no idea about the draft. I mean, if there was a draft now, you'd see a lot more outcry <laughs> about, <laughs> uh, seriously, you know. And I think there are a lot of people who adopted Ali right. as, as a hero. Uh, yeah. And also he was, I mean, he was great too. I mean, we could get into that later when we talk yeah. about, uh, yeah. you know, Kaepernick and all that. You right. do have to be, in, in our business and sports, you do have to win. <laughs> yes, I mean, you have to win. Yeah. You have to be a champion. You can't finish in seventh place, you know, because nobody cared. You, <laughs> uh, really, you have to right. win. But we'll talk about that right. later. And I just want to make a shout out here to Curtis McClinton, who is a former Chiefs player. Um, and he had hoped to be here tonight, but he was unable to attend. So um, I just wanted to give him a shout out there. Um, and oh, uh, we're going to watch a little video. You uh, interviewed um, Jim Brown. Um, uh, so this is yeah, a little snippet. The, uh, he came yeah. up to Harlem to my barbershop. Yeah, yeah. Jim Brown has been called the greatest athlete in American history. A member of the Pro Football and the Cross Halls of Fame, Brown was a decathlete in track and a high-scoring forward in basketball. Although he left the NFL in 1965, Brown is still regarded as the greatest football player who ever lived. On a recent trip to New York, Brown made a visit to my barbershop in Harlem, USA for a spirited conversation with the crew. We talked about everything from the state of NFL labor negotiations to Brown's support of Muhammad Ali during the Vietnam War. Could you explain this a bit, because to, to those people know it, what this picture is about? Oh, you got this? How'd you get this, man? Oh, oh, yeah. oh that's, oh, that's man. the picture, man. That's, that's the picture, oh, man. Yeah. That's the... And they were giving him Muhammad Ali Hill. Yeah. They'd taken his crown away from him, and they were ostracizing him, and they were propagandizing him. And I said to John, who was my chairman of the Black Economic Union, I said, John, uh, I think we should do something about supporting Ali. Why don't you call the top black athletes in the country, tell them I want to meet them in Cleveland, and we're going to get with Ali and discuss his situation, get it firsthand from him. Muhammad Ali refused to be drafted during the Vietnam War based on his religious beliefs. He was arrested and found guilty of draft evasion. His conviction was appealed and made its way all the way to the Supreme Court, where it was overturned. We came out as a unified group of black men saying that we totally support Muhammad Ali. And today, they tell me, he says that was one of the greatest times of his life, one of the greatest moments of his life. To bring that picture up does my heart good. And we love you, And to recognize now. <laughs> Do you think this would ever happen again? Do you think that yes. this Yes. It's a slow process because you have to educate and not alienate. And I think within the next three or four years, uh, there'll be a major coming together of black athletes and in some entertainers to really have a platform that can bring about a whole different awareness. Let's talk about NFL labor because that's kind of... I think that's good. Yeah, that's great. Great interview. Uh, Right. Well, I know I'm kind of moving along. Let's LeBron, let's. LeBron wasn't the first one to do the barbershop, by the way. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> how many did you do in the barbershop? Huh? Well, I think we did like three. Three. Oh, okay. Roger Goodell. But anyway, but you know, it was just Joe. You know, LeBron would remember he was like suing somebody because I did the barbershop. I said, brother, I stole it from somebody. I mean. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Well, let's sort of now talk about um, sort of this history of black athletes and activism and sort of bring it up to the present day. And going back to 1960, with the, the amazing Wilma Rudolph, who was with Ali and, and won gold um, at the Olympics, and they became lifelong friends. Um, a little bit, tell us a little bit about her, her activism. Uh, yeah, that's a great picture. That, that's really a great picture. Yeah, they were really tight. They got to be really good friends. But the thing that I don't think a lot of people knew about Wilma Rudolph. I certainly didn't know it as a kid. My father, who was a track guy, loved Wilma Rudolph. Loved Wilma Rudolph. What I did not know is when she came back from the Olympics, she was from Clarksville, Tennessee, and uh, they wanted to have a parade and a, and a banquet in her honor. And she told the city of Tennessee that there would not be a uh, segregated parade, there would not be a segregated banquet 
And because of Wilma Rudolph, uh, Clarksville, Tennessee had this, uh, their first integrated parade and their first uh, integrated banquet. And again, that's one of those um, unrecognized acts of heroism mm -hmm. that, and, and Wilma was, she was like that. I mean, she was really strong like that. People didn't really recognize it again because all over there they saw as a black gazelle running, but she was really a race woman. She mm -hmm. was really about that. And I'm sure I, I saw them interact um, later on when he was sort of ill. But mm -hmm. I think she really had an impact on Ali just in terms of using his podium and not being, mm -hmm. be silly, but be directive. I think she really had an impact on mm -hmm. him, a positive impact. Mm -hmm. I think also what's important about Wilma and, and her generation is that going back to the 1920s, a famous race in the, in the, the 1928 Olympics, and where some women fall down and people become horrified. And so the opportunities for women to compete in track and field and other sports start to diminish. And then what happens is that largely two African-American historically black colleges in universities, Tuskegee and Tennessee State, really began to dominate women's track and field and really sort of keep sporting opportunities open to women. Because one of the other things that happens during this era is the Soviet Union comes back into the Olympics in 1952, and it becomes a proxy for the, the social systems, US democracy versus the Soviet capitalist, excuse me, the Soviet communist system. And through most of the Olympics, early Olympics, if you only count the men's medals, the United States wins. If you count the men's and women's medals, the Soviet Union wins. Mm -hmm. And so within the United States, there's an effort to try to minimize and mm -hmm. suppress the significance of, of women's sports. And mm -hmm. so Wilma and her teammates, the school like small little historically black school like Tennessee State between 1950 and 1970 sent 40 women to, to the Olympics. Wow. Mm. And so it, I think it's really important to think about her, mm -hmm. but also that, that era that she symbolizes. Yeah, that's fascinating. I did not know that. Um, of course, we can't leave the 60s without sort of mentioning this iconic uh, photograph um, of the uh, at the at the Olympics in Mexico City. Um, you guys want to say anything about that or? Not self-explanatory. It sort of is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, can't it be is. confused by that. Message, <laughs> yeah. you know? uh, again, just like I remember for for, for me again, I, I think I was uh, uh, eighteen. I was a, a, a freshman at Morgan Morgan State, and uh, you know, I remember for me it was you had Ali in terms of people athletes who sort of would show me a what a black athlete could do. And even as a journalist, the standard I would hold people to, you had um, Ali, mm -hmm. uh, then you had the summit, Jim Brown, then you had this. Then in 69, you had Kurt Flood. You had Kurt Flood, who basically changed the whole business dynamic of professional sports when he basically forced owners to uh, take athletes off the plantation and pay them. Mm. And, and, and Flood, and I've really been on this crusade for him to be in the Hall of Fame because there is a direct line between Kurt Flood and every single athlete who signs multi-billion dollar, mm. billion dollar contracts. And he paid a tremendous price, as did they. Mm -hmm. you know? um, so, uh, you know, we've both been you know, seeing them over the years, but just the impact that that gesture made <laughs> was phenomenal. I mean, they, again, they've been on speaking tours and blah, blah, but there's, there's no more powerful um, statement mm -hmm. that I think that has been made in pictorial sports than that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would just like to point out two of their goals um, in the larger Olympic project for human rights. One was the restoration of Muhammad, Muhammad Ali's title. Although the International Olympic Committee had no ability to do that, that was important to them because the stripping of Ali's title 
meant that an African-American's rights could be easily taken away. Mm -hmm. And so that was really important to them that they had to stand up and speak out against that injustice. One of their other goals was to keep South Africa, apartheid era South Africa, out of the Olympics. And that's really important because that speaks to Peter Norman's role here, the Australian runner who won the silver medal and who wore a badge on his lapel. Mm -hmm. He was ostracized because Australia and South Africa were major allies. Mm -hmm. And he was seen as denouncing South Africa. And so when he went back home, rather than being a hero, he was demonized. And so I think a lot of people mm -hmm. miss, miss his importance in this protest as well. Hmm. So now thinking of Ali's legacy uh, today, and of course the name Colin Kaepernick comes up um, mm -hmm. as uh, the name that everyone sort of talks about with respect to sort of aligning athletes and, and social justice protest. Um, yeah, why don't you begin to unravel this complexity? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot going on here. I'll just, just make one, <laughs> one statement about this. I think this is really important to think about the larger context. You know, athletes don't start social revolutions. What they do is respond to them. And so in the case of Kaepernick, it's people in Ferguson um, protesting Mike Brown's death. It's people in New York protesting um, Eric Garner's death. That, that rally around. And what happens is that athletes become part of that movement and see the role that they can play. In the case of Kaepernick and others, it was to take conversations that were happening in locales and to nationalize those conversations. And so I think in many ways that, that is the importance of athletes in social movements is, is to use their platform to become a voice for the larger movement. I think sometimes we have a tendency to think about athletes in isolation rather than to see them as, as parts of, of this larger struggle. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and you know, I was thinking as we were looking at Joe Lewis and Ali, Jackie Robbins, where does he fit in? Mm -hmm. For this generation, mm -hmm. and probably he is the most, I'd say, significant black athlete uh, of his generation and the fact that he plays quarterback. Mm. Um, and I think that what was eye opening to a lot of people is how the power structure basically did the equivalent of taking him out to the yard and flogging him when they blatantly just blackballed him. Mm -hmm. uh, still without, a, you know, with, without a job. Uh, but but I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, the role of athletes, the role of Ali, the role of is to be this, this symbol. And uh, in fact, I had a conversation with uh, Michelle Roberts, who's the um, executive director of the Players Association. And I was thinking that the role, the new activism, the role that athletes can play today is basically playing a major role in, in a voter registration mm. movement. Not necessarily telling people who to vote for, but just using their visibility to encourage their demographics, which are millennials and um, uh, Gen Zers. Mm -hmm. to register to vote. And I think, you know, that's sort of a new, a new activism. Yeah. Mm -hmm. can, can I say one more thing about sure. Kaepernick? Is, is that recently I heard someone say that, that Colin Kaepernick is the Rosa Parks of his generation. And I said, I don't know. Yeah, yes. Because it's, it depends on what happens. If we look back 20 years from now, and there's all these ref this reform, prison industrial complex, um, policing, things like that, then we could say that possibly that he's right. the Rosa Parks, but the work has to be done and it has to be the people now taking advantage of this enlarged platform. And heretofore, I don't know that that's happened. Mm -hmm. And that to me, that's one of the, 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 the points of the NFL players and their, their involvement is that what's happened subsequent to that? How have people taken that platform and been good stewards of it? Yeah, yeah. in fact, I think, you know, they're saying that he um, was a catalyst for protest. But I think, 
I think it may have been the end of it because when when these a lot of us saw what they did to him and saw how they basically flogged him and said you will never work again, I think that put a chill mm-hmm. on a lot of a lot of activism. And you know when they when they formed the Players Coalition, immediately co-op the movement. I mean immediately co-op the movement. You mm-hmm. know that divide and conquer is such an obvious playbook. So um, and then it gets back to championships too. I always maintain that you know if Kaepernick had won the Super Bowl one or two, we have, we'd be having a different conversation. <laughs> you know, I mean, you, in our business, you gotta you, you have to be a cha- like if Tommy Smith and John Carlos, who we saw in the previous film, well, they won medals. If they would have finished eighth and ninth, or if Ali would have been like a a, a tomato right. can and got knocked out <laughs> every other fight, you know, we wouldn't be having these conversations in our business, particularly with black folks in a in a in a thing where where in an in in industry where things are measured, mm-hmm. you know, how high do you jump? Mm-hmm. Who gets to cross the line first? It's not your daddy's money. Not that do you? That's why black folks are sixty nine percent of the NBA and seventy nine percent of the of the NFL because at not only two less than that of the hierarchy mm-hmm. of, the, of the of the power structure. So um, you yeah, gotta, it's a good. You got to win. Good point. <laughs> Um, we are kind of nearing the end. I didn't know if, any, if there's questions. We wanted to leave some time for questions. Um, did you guys have any? Did anybody write anything down on the card or? Anybody have any answers? You pass that. Yeah. And then. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, so this is kind of related. So what are your thoughts on why black athletes didn't get together to support Colin Kaepernick in the way that the Cleveland Summit was convened? Why? And you kind of just, I think, talked about that a little bit. Yeah, well, number one, somebody also pointed out in that Cleveland Summit picture, none of them had agents. Mm-hmm. If, they, if they would have had agents, you know, and most of the agents were, like, were going to be white for the most part, and it was all this kind of money on the line, you can imagine some of the conversations that would yeah. be had then. Um, but also, I really fault um, the players' union. I default, mm. I, I fault uh, the Morris Smith and the players for not mobilizing mm-hmm. uh, because it was a labor issue, you know. So uh, I, now I think that was a strategic blunder uh, on, on the part of uh, the Players Association not to rally behind him. And I think it's going to really hurt them uh, come negotiation time where they're going to mm-hmm. really need unity. This could have been a perfect... Uh, practice run for unity mm-hmm. and the fact that they didn't I think it's going to really hurt them once again speaking of which can, can the next picture I wanted to the, the, mm-hmm. that we had here yeah. this is when you talk about unity and you talk about talk mm-hmm. about the power of unions one of the things that that we know about athletes they make a lot of money but um, certainly because they're great talents but also because they have the most powerful unions in this country in what other industry do athletes receive a proceed, uh, a percentage of the proceeds? That's incredible. And so now we're also in the midst of the U.S. women's soccer team unionizing and trying to use their collective force to um, fight for gender equality, to ensure that women get their appropriate portion of, of resources that's devoted to soccer. And so this is now one of the most important moments for, for social justice going on in the sports world. And, and as I understand it, this is an image from, from uh, this week. So these mm-hmm. are ongoing questions and conversations. Mm-hmm. They turned their jersey, yeah. And that was exactly the question that was handed to me. It was like, comment on the US women's soccer teams. So that's great. Um, <laughs> we're just so psychic up here. Uh, <laughs> There are a lot of books about Muhammad Ali. Do you have any favorites that you might recommend? I like the one, although it's not, I like the one that he wrote with, um, uh, it's called The Greatest, the book called The Greatest. It's like his, uh, and he wrote it with somebody who was like in the Nation of Islam. Yeah, yeah, the Nation of Islam came out in 1975. Yeah, The Greatest, uh, and a lot of people say, wow, well, that was a scholarly book and all that, but it was fun. <laughs> <laughs> it was a fun book. I mean, I like. In fact, there was one, there was one quote in there that I always use. I think it was when he was going to uh, fight um, George Foreman, and I think his trainer at that. I think it wasn't Bundini. It was another trainer. But 
he told he told Ali, he said, you know, there comes a point in your life where you've got to go into the lion's den and snatch the meat out of the lion's jaw. Now, if you do it and fail, now if you do it and fail, the people will still love you. But if you never try it, the people will never forgive you. And I always thought that, you know, whether it's made or not, great story and as a journalist. But let's not even go down there. Yeah. I, I like that. <laughs> my, my favorite is uh, David Remnick's book, mm -hmm. The King of the World. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that David Remnick just has a way with words. But it's also important, a historic kind of um, engagement with the early 1960s, where he talks about Floyd Patterson as the symbol of integration and Sonny Liston as this sort of symbol of, of the black, bad, bad guy kind of character. And then Ali is this sort of separatist. I think that's my favorite. Mm -hmm. favorite. I would also say my favorite documentary is uh, When We Were Kings, which mm -hmm. is about Ali's fight against George Foreman. That's, uh, that's probably my favorite piece. I like, I like you. What's the documentary? I like the documentary, uh, it was the fight with Frazier and Ali, A Nation Divided. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, thought that, I thought that was a great documentary because yeah. it kind of put it right yep. front, front and center and you, you kind of came out with a whole nother, no matter how you felt about Frazier, mm -hmm. you know, you kind of came out a little more, wow, Ali, that was kind of tough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. Yeah, those are all terrific. Um, I'm just going to show a couple of pictures from Damien's museum uh, that give you a sense, too, of I like the, how you said sports leveling the playing field. Um, and of course, the great iconic picture turned into a, a, a sculpture there. Um, and then just how, you know, you think of, of creating an exhibit around Ali. Um, I think at our, our museum, you know, it's not a Hall of Fame, our sports gallery, but it is a gallery which tries to use sports as, as mm -hmm. entryways into larger political, social, and cultural conversations. And so um, when you talk about people from the 1960s who, whose impact has transcended the world of sports, um, certainly Ali is, is among the most significant. And one of the great, great uh, parts of this is that LeBron James and his business, Carter, Maverick, business partner, Maverick Carter, decided to, to donate $2.5 million mm. to the museum and that gave wow. them naming rights. And mm. when they had to decide which area of the museum they wanted to name, they chose the Muhammad Ali mm. uh, space. And so that really speaks to, I think, how, how mm. LeBron sees himself in this sort of trajectory of, of uh, African-American athletes. Yeah. By the way, you, you, I don't know if it was, if, if, how many people have come to the museum. It's, it's phenomenal. And what you've done with the sports thing there is tremendous, man. You should really, mm -hmm. you should really be uh, applauded for the work you've done. And uh, it's, it's, it's really, really tremendous. You should come to the museum if you want to see $40 million slaves in exhibition form. <laughs> Very seriously. Right. I mean, it is the most, most important book written on sports in the last 30 mm -hmm. years. Washington, D.C. Yeah. Is it open? Is yeah. it open? Today <laughs> yeah. it is, right? As a of fact, I think. It is yeah. Open. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, Thank you both so much. This, we could go on a long time, but this was a fantastic conversation. And if you could join me in thanking Bill and Damien for coming. Thank you so much. Thank you. You'd be great. Thank you. Great. Thank you for thank coming. You. Yeah, thank be you. Be safe. Thank you. Great. Great, great job. Great job.